Welcome to the Point of No Return podcast, a show at the intersection of technology and strategy. On this show, we interview industry leaders and experts to better understand how they think about strategy during this time of exponential progress. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Point of No Return podcast. Today's show features Katarina Rizzi, co-founder at Breather. I had the pleasure of meeting Katarina for the first time for this podcast, and I have to say I was really impressed. Katarina is a serial entrepreneur. She's played a, a leading role in the successful creation and launch of a few international brands that engage people and create meaningful experiences. She has a great ability to read trends, and like we, we dug into this part in, during the podcast. Uh, she's built innovative products and translates these ideas to viable strategies uh, that has really helped her set a, be set apart and allowed her to work on some really cool and important projects. As Breather's co-founder, she was responsible for co-conceiving of the Breather Peace and Quiet On Demand concept and creating the full experience for Breather's members, including the designing of the spaces and directing the brand strategy. Uh, we had a really good wide-ranging conversation. Uh, we spoke about the inception story of Breather that I was actually I didn't know about, how we're of mouth helped fuel breather in the early days and helped it spread like wildfire. The importance that mentorship has played in her career, a founder's most valuable commodity, and the importance of disconnecting after work. I had a real blast uh, talking with Katarina. She has a bunch of interesting and contrarian views about the tech industry. I learned a ton and I hope that you do as well. Katarina, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for inviting me. A re real pleasure to meet you. Uh, obviously, been a fan. I've been following you ever since. I think that, it, like I said before we started recording, I'd seen you speak uh, at an event. I think that you forgot about <laughs> since you've done so many of these. Um, I guess my my first question would be: Is how did you get involved in the startup space? How did it come to be? Um, it really was with Breather. I mean, before that, my background was in retail. I worked for a big Canadian retailer, so it. Uh, the reason that I ended up working on Breather is because my co-founder, who was an acquaintance of mine, knew that I was a designer and uh, basically asked me to help him create the concept for the idea that he had. So, you know, when we first started, I didn't even I didn't know the first thing about startup life or what startups were or raising capital or anything like that. The first time actually that uh, someone mentioned, you know, selling the company, I was like, we're not selling our company <laughs> like ever. It's ours. Like, you know, like and they're like, yeah, but Kat, this is what you do when you raise money. And I was like, really? Like, you know, so like that's literally how it was just by chance. Right. Mm. It's not something I ever you hadn't planned that out. But, so how was not the, at all? Like, it was the idea. Yeah. The idea was what was really interesting yeah. to me how long uh, yeah, you were at dynamite i believe right before, yeah right before so like you had a good safe steady job i'm sure your your uh, your friends and your family were like you know well done like you know you're working at a very recognized kind of kind of company how did it was it easy to make that call to switch into something like that's a complete unknown obviously co-founding something from the ground up right well it wasn't an immediate switch i didn't leave there to do that i actually um so yeah like you're saying my mother was very pleased with me i got a job after art school which was the one thing she asked me to do <laughs> she never she never no one ever tried to stop me. The mother was just like, just get a good job after, okay? And I was like, no problem, mom. Like, you know, like, I'll figure mm -hmm. that out. So I left actually because I was done with it. I was, it was burning me out and I just, you know, didn't like going to work anymore. And that was a problem for me. I had given it a good six years, which people are in retail are like, like, and you know, and let's talk about like the years before in retail where I worked at store level. So I feel like I gave it, you know, a good shot. But when I left, I was like, so what, what do I do now? Like my whole career. It was in retail and I don't want to do retail anymore, right? So um, I, ha I took like a year or two off. I did some other stuff and uh, did a brief stint in an ad agency, started to Ooh, slowly okay. go towards startup, you know what I mean? More like, you Which know, agency like, actually? Uh, it used to be called NBI. Now it's, Oh my God, I got acquired I prospect, by... Yeah, I prospect, so thank you. It's a small world. So my business partner, Jeff, used to be a partner at, really? uh, at NVI. And he was the one responsible for selling it, actually. So yeah. Oh, that's and it was funny. In a small world. I didn't know one. I didn't know that yeah. either. Okay, well, that's interesting. Anyway, so yeah, yeah. Breather, Breather was... There was like a two-year gap before mm. when I left uh, Dynamite mm. and uh, started Breather. And... Uh, I don't know. I've, I've noticed I tend to stay at jobs for five, six years. <laughs> I'm one of those the anomalies that doesn't yeah. jump every year or two. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing is for me is find when I find a place where I'm happy, it's mm -hmm. like I'm I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm I'm in. I'm attached. You can't get rid of me. You yeah. know. So like 
did you do you feel that uh, the skill sets that you had acquired in your, in your previous career were useful, or had you did you have to just learn like a bunch of different things that you you didn't know? I mean, both because the you know, like I said, when I left retail, I was like, what what am I qualified to do? You know, and I and I had I actually ended up uh, by chance getting a mentor that basically ripped my CV apart, and she was like, "Cat, let's like like we need to rebrand you. Like, let's stop looking at what your like you know like what your previous jobs were, and instead looking let's start looking at what your skills are. Like, what are you good at? You know, and um, that is something I recommend to a lot of people that I you know coach or advise or whatnot is to really you know look at your actual talents. You know, not not in the specific zone of like retail. Like, you know, like so yeah, I'm I'm good at curating." styling display stuff like that but that means that also translates to i can design rooms which is what i did you know for breather by creating the concept for it so those skills transferred perfectly over to what my first sort of task was with breather um once you know we raised money and started to actually um hire a team and whatnot and grow the company into like 300 plus people then you know then you be- then you become it's like becoming a parent right like it's like no one teaches you how to do it but you have to you have to learn, uh, but you've got to learn everything quickly and everything. So, you know, building the culture or whatnot, I, we have to learn everything. And we had to le- learn it either from people or from our experiences and be really thoughtful about what, you know, what kind of company we wanted to create and what kind of environment we wanted. There were so many psychological things that I found were really, really important to creating, you know, like you're so you know glad these people are coming to work for you every day. Right. Like, so, um, it was that those new skills to learn were infinite and, you know, constant and mm. they never let up. There were mm. just new ones that you had to learn yeah. on top of it. So how did you, because it looks like you got really good at learning new skills really quickly. Did you like actively, sp- you know, spend any deliberate thought on, okay, how do I like improve, let's say fundraising skills or improve culture skills? Like, did you spend some time or was it just because of the craziness of a startup? You just like, you have no choice. You, you just need to get good at it and you figure out a way Curious if you had a, like a thought process on, on learning how to learn. I mean, you have no choice. Like yeah. that's, that's a fact. So it's basically like you're either good at this or you fail. Mm-hmm. Like, so it's, um, so I mean, stuff that had to do with culture or, you know, anything internally with the company, there was, you know, I read a lot of books, whatever, you know, I looked at a lot of other companies with kind of perks they had. And, you know, when I say I hate perks, cause that means like beer on tap, you know what I mean? But I ping mean, pong. Yeah. yeah. Like, and we had a ping pong table. People loved it, you know, like, but so like I, for me, it was like, what, what were, what are the actual tangible benefits to working at coming to work for breather? Right. Cause you had to recruit all these people. We had sometimes 10 people starting a week, you know, from different companies. So, so you had to go find the best talent. So how do you get them to pick your, you know, at the time, maybe smaller startup than, you know, these other places you can go work. And, uh, so that stuff was really more intuitive for me. Like I spent a lot of time thinking about how I'd like to be treated and what would make me happy in previous good and bad experiences, you know, that I'd had in jobs and everything. So that sort of slowly built up that culture and whatnot. And then, you know, things like fundraising and whatnot. Yeah. You learn from other people, you beg people to like, you know, let you pick their brains, you know, like, but, and then one thing that I find a lot of startups, uh, like founders should do that I found out in my opinion, like too late in the game, I would have loved this from day one is get yourself an exact like job coach. Someone who's like deals with these people all the time knows exactly what boat you're in and how you're going to grow. And you know what I mean? And learn from that stuff. And you know, it's, it's because of my experience doing this that I actually um, started advising startups because I'm like, I've done this. I've been in your shoes. I know what this is like. All the little details, you know, that you, you know, freaking out in the middle of the night about something and, you know, like none of your friends understand because they don't do it, you know, like, so um, it became important to me to start trying to like give that, that information back to yeah. people. So yeah. Paying it, paying it forward essentially. Yeah. Well, a lot of people were really gracious to my co-founder and I, when we first started breather. So I, we both sort of felt like, you know, if we could, we should be mm-hmm. trying to do the same thing for other yeah. people. What do you find was the most challenging part in the early days? early days was getting people to use it (laughs) to use breather spaces because it was a new concept so no one really understood what it was so that getting people to like across the lease line where they can see the room and be like oh this is really cool oh i could host this in here or i could do this you know that was the that was the biggest hurdle you know like at the beginning is Mm -hmm. trying to try to get people to understand what your new this thing that doesn't exist is and why they should even use it right Mm -hmm. 
Uh, another skill I find that uh, you didn't mention before is uh, communication. So, like, uh, you know, you've obviously done a lot of public speaking, and it's uh, something I think that I've also tried to cultivate and get better at. Um, just curious as to how how did you get good at, uh, at speaking in front of a crowd? I, I don't think I'm good at speaking in front okay. of a crowd. I think it's um, I, something for me, I really do not like public speaking. Like okay. that is something I'm very adamant about. But I was I realized that if we wanted to publicize the company, I was going to have to go put myself out there and, and speak. So, um, you know, my biggest fear, and this has been something since I was a kid, like I did not want to go on stage at school. You know, it just I'm just happier in the background. And uh, so I started saying, you know, I'll do one keynote every three months but that's it because that's so much stress for me but i'm happy to do interviews podcasts q and a's whatnot because there was nothing for me to rehearse like i could speak you know and i'm i'm you know i'm happy and confident about our you know the company and whatnot so you know and i know what i'm talking about in regards to the company so there was nothing for me that would make me nervous it was literally having to get up st on stage and like you know dance so to speak you know like not only did i have to make this big presentation that was super you know interesting that kept people's attention and this that and and talked about something new that they hadn't already heard but i also had to like rehearse it time it properly do all the you know what i mean like basically like perform for them so to me that was like just way too much um fear of like screwing stuff up and i've had it happen where i've like literally tanked on stage or this like all the av went down and i'm in front of hundreds of people and i have to like all of a sudden put on like a comedy show while they're fixing it so like it's i didn't learn you know like it wasn't yeah. something i just i tried to I, I devise a lot of tips and tricks to make sure as much as possible that I didn't fail. Um, and, you know, and I had to push myself out of my comfort zone and do it. Yeah. It's just something that didn't come naturally yeah. to me. The reason I bring it up is I tried to link it actually to the, your previous point uh, about getting getting people across the line into the room, mm -hmm. right? Because the, the category you guys are playing in doesn't exist, right? Mm -hmm. Like how many companies similar to exactly what Breather is doing exist, right? You're not like another car manufacturer. It's yeah. just... So there's an, an important notion of storytelling. You have to communicate what the story was. At that point in time, now I think people kind of get it and understand. A yeah, bit more. it's different. It's a whole different ballgame now. But in your, you had to do all the hard work of like, no, 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 you're going to like take your phone. <laughs> you're going to book it right. So there's a notion of communication and storytelling, which I find you got, you're not giving yourself enough credit. By saying, by saying you're not a good public speaker, even if it's in uh, maybe not specifically the, the format of speaking in front of a crowd, but being able to communicate a message uh, and get it across in a, in a storytelling way. Uh, oh, no, then in that, in that scenario, it's completely different. I mean, literally getting up in front of hundreds of people on a stage. That's when I, when you say communication, public yeah. speaking, that's what I, t I understand. I'm not shy. Like, that's the thing. I'm pretty, I'm pretty chatty. Um, so speaking with, like one-on-one -on -one with customers or in front of a small group of people um, and telling a story, you know, telling that story of like, you know, get, like connecting with them. That, that is something that I think just from being Italian and not being shy sort of come na comes naturally to me. But, you know, it's also years of being in customer experience. When you're a salesperson, it's, these are basic skills, right? So sales tactics and whatnot that you learn from like selling shoes, mm -hmm. you know, like if you're, you know, you're nice to them, you can anticipate their needs, you can connect with them, you listen to them, like those basic skills are what's going to allow you to really get through to them and make them, you know, feel like you're, you're there to help them and you're there to show them and you're not being like, I can't believe you don't understand what yeah. this is. Like. <laughs> and how did you manage to do it at scale? Because obviously it seems like it wasn't just like, you know, the one-on-one -on -one presentation. You guys did this at a very large scale where it was a one-to-many conversation. Do you find there's any particular ways that, that you're able to, to, to figure it out, to communicate it simply? Um, it, I mean, honestly, I a lot of breathers scaling came from great word of mouth from people that had already used the spaces, right? Because whenever, you know, you had your early adopters that we did everything possible to make sure their experiences were like the greatest ever, ever. Right. And, um, and so, you know, then someone else would come along that they knew and be like, what's that thing breather? It sounds kind of sketchy. And they're like, and you know, and they're like, Oh no, I use it. I do meet it. And they're like, what do you do in there? They're like, Oh, we have meetings there all the time. They're like, Oh, Okay. And they're like, yeah, it's super cool because like, you know, that you can just like check in on your phone and just walk right in. And they're like, there's no key. And they're like, no, you don't even have to talk to anyone. So like people would do our PR for us because then, you know, they were like, they were 
like early adopters, they were like, I'm in, this is cool. I want this to succeed. And you know, they'd write us, they'd be like, you know, this is really cool, but you know, there, I always have this issue whenever I'm in the room. Cause you're trying to fix that. Like they were so gracious. Like, you know, like I want this to work because now that I use it, I don't know what I'm going to do if I didn't have it anymore. Right. So that's really what it helped breather scale was, it was our teams doing a wonderful job of connecting with our, you know, our guests and, helping them with anything they needed and really making everything as easy as possible for them. Cause it, that was the whole thing. It's just supposed to be easy. Like the whole point of the space was so that people could go do whatever hard thing they wanted to do in there. You know what I mean? That they want to, you know, they have to worry about their meeting, presenting in front of a bunch of people. We're the ones who are responsible for making sure they get in quickly, that everything's to their expectations. And if it's not, we did whatever it took to make sure that it was. Yeah. So that combination of like, it's like going to a restaurant and having like the greatest like waiter or waitress alive, right? This person's like super chatty. They're making sure you're like well taken care of, you know, and then they go do something that's like, extra that you're like wow you're like the greatest and then you walk away and you're like oh i had this great meal at this great place and this person was terrific you know like it's really people connecting with people that make people endorse brands or services mm-hmm. that's my feeling about it yeah. yeah it sounds like you guys invested so much in making sure that the experience the product the design was just way above people's expectations that it just grew virally from there. Yeah, to a certain extent, you know, there's definitely, you know, growing pains and whatnot, but it's hospitality, you know, like everyone's always like, you know, I'd always hear Breather, oh, Breather's a tech company. I'm like, no, Breather's a, Breather's hospitality (laughs) and real estate that's tech enabled. And like, this is really about hospitality when it comes down to it. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree. Like a lot of people say Uber's a tech company, right? Like, But they don't actually create technology, right? Like they're a transportation logistics company right? yeah, that's exactly. empowered by tech right i think yeah. there's a big difference right like you're not microsoft where you're writing software yeah exactly um they're using microsoft products or google products or whatever i think the startup uh, industry just you know th- you know everyone thinks of the startup industry as a tech industry right mm-hmm. so everyone's like tech companies and i'm like we're not all tech companies yeah. you know but we might be a startup but not be a tech company yeah. at what point in time and I'll, I'll stop talking about breather but like i'm just <laughs> curious at, at what point in time did, did you and julian realize okay we got something here it's not just like the original idea you know be it like uh, of, of something that you guys created based on your own pain points yeah. right if i understand the inception story from there to okay holy shit there's some there's something here i think the first time i thought there's something here was actually before we ever had any spaces the, we had done these experiments these very grassroots experiments where we bought we bought a phone and we papered the city with um these like I literally I just went into like Illustrator and wrote like text this to like you know like literally just wrote some text out on a white sheet and it just said they said stuff like there was three different ones I think it was sleep study and tired or something I'm not sure what they were exactly anymore but it was like it was like text um sleep if you're tired what you know if you're tired or text this if you're that so people started texting us and we started to literally I literally sat there with my phone and would like had a notebook and I would literally tick off like the category. And then we started telling people we'd answer them and be like, every time you feel sleepy, text me. Because we were curious how many times a day they, people wanted to get away from what they were doing in their job. Because at the first breather was, you know, really about peace and quiet. So it was going to be somewhere you can go take a nap or, you know, relax or um, do a phone call or whatnot, you know. So like, or do some work in private. The whole point was to get away from everybody. So we started we we started doing this thing and the thing is we had like hundreds of people that would text us and i that's when i was going jesus everybody's got this problem secretly but no one's doing you know like somehow we've not had a conversation about it in society that people mm-hmm. want to be away from other people it was really weird yeah. that was the first time i was really like this is so strange like yeah. it's so weird that this isn't something that's like a, a t- a conversation topic. Yeah. I really like that. I actually had no idea you guys did that. That's yeah, we did a lot of weird testing <laughs> things that I can't talk about. Um, <laughs> but I love that idea because it's, it's taking something that uh, quote unquote doesn't scale, right? Uh, a, la, a la back to your point about tech and, and startups to something that's like, they just figure this out and see how, how it works and what people are actually looking for. Just um, people were cra- craving peace and quiet. Yeah. It was like, people are like, you know, like breather, oh, breather's workspaces. I'm like, yeah, but that's actually not the offering. The offering is privacy. Hmm. Like that's what it, that's what we're actually selling is privacy. Yeah, 
Because if it was that, if that wasn't the case, then we would have open spaces with you know different desks of people working next, like a co-working space, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's what was that's what makes it different from a co-working space. It's private rooms that no one else can, you know what I mean? Like share with you. That's it was. It's funny the notion of like you know when we're you know online life is all about connecting with each other and that we just went and sort of went like let's make a place where no one has to connect at all Hmm. yeah very apropos subject let's not talk about facebook um (laughs) um, yeah i could take this in a few directions i guess i'd maybe talk about a little bit switch gears outside of and talk about just your startup experience because i find you have like you said you're doing some advising and you have uh i find very interesting and contrarian points of view uh, about the space just because you've been in it and you've seen you know like you've seen how it's gone um where does you, where does your thought process come from when it comes to startups i know we we're chatting about let's say going events and you're like you know f events like that you're not going to gain any value out of it uh so just curious what are your general thoughts on the startup industry today and how do you have a contrarian point of view or at least let's say not the common point of view that most people have. No, I just, I just, I, I don't, I don't think there's no. Let me just to be clear, I don't think there's. No, you're not necessarily gonna get something valuable out of going to an event. I just, I find networking painfully, like boring to do. <laughs> like, I don't like making. I love. I'm really chatty, and I can talk to you for hours. But I do not like making idle chit chat. And I think that sort of goes back to this founder. I have a founder mentality that my time is very valuable. Everything, every, you know, even if I'm at home. I, and maybe it's also the Italian in me, like I should be doing something, right? And so with the idea that my time is very valuable to me and something has to be worth it to me to to spe- to go and do it. So I don't find networking, like making idle chit-chat valuable. I would, if somebody invited me to a dinner of like a whole bunch of people, that I would find valuable because it would be more like these people are here because someone picked them to be here and we're here to talk about X or whatever, then I find that extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. And I feel like then I can really actually connect with people. Mm -hmm. But at events with some cheap beer in my hand, talking to, I don't even know who, you know what I mean? About, I don't know what, like, that's it. I don't find, I just don't find that super valuable. Yeah, no, I so relate. And maybe that, maybe networking needs to have a revamp. That's, that's something that might be interesting. That's a good idea, actually. Um, (laughs) It's like, you know, um, I find that I kind of agree with you. I have the, you know, the same Greek thing where if I'm not doing something, I'm wasting my life. Um, and That's it's just like, the guilt that our parents have. This <laughs> is so, like shame and guilt. Yeah. Uh, and I find that, you know, you, you obviously addicted to social media and I, I look at stuff like, oh, there's this and this, this and this event. Oh, I should have gone. And it's like, you realize actually I have work to do that's probably more productive and, uh, kind of how I've switched it and going back to your idea that, um, you know, we, we do once or twice a quarter, we do this like CEO dinners with, with our customers and with people mm-hmm. that we know. And, I find that so much better use of yeah, our time definitely. and their time too, because you get to connect and we're not there to sell anything, which is like just smart people meeting smart people. And I find that's a much more effective use of time rather than general uh, laissez faire, let's say networking event. Um, what other advice do you see that, you know, the founders should be taking today that they're not necessarily taking the popular advice. That's not usually the best. Hmm. I'm trying to think. I mean, Like I said, getting as much external help from really great people as possible, seeking those people out. How would you go about doing that? Like I've heard the exec coaching, I've thought about it, and I've like I've I've not pulled the trigger on it. How does that work? Like how do like do you just go Google like executive coach? No, get a recommendation. Okay, so definitely ask your network basically. Yeah, because like I can like I have two terrific ones that Mm -hmm. do are that have totally different work styles. It's like you know it's uh, so anyways that there when there's a good one. They're really worth the money, like really worth it. And mm. because nobody understands what you're going through, yeah. like it's not like something it's, it's almost like having, like seeing a therapist in a sense, but they're, this one's helping you with your work <laughs> instead yeah. of your personal life, you know, but mm. you're, when you're a founder, your work life is practically your whole life. So it's like, you know, like, and you're trying to figure it out like in hyper growth. So like, and these people have done this before, but I mean, they're not, it's, I'm not just, you know, I rec- I definitely recommend executive coaching, but I think there's also, you know, other founders that maybe you're inspired by, or they might not even be founders. They could be anybody that you're inspired by, but somebody that's going to be able to teach you something or allow you to learn something, you know, and to that point, 
people all the t- people always go to me oh yeah but you know I'm not how do I even reach out to them I'm like you write them a nice email and you ask them for 15 minutes of their time you know and or if they don't have the time here are three questions I'd love to hear from you I'm like what's the worst that happens they don't get back to you I've done it a bunch of times like with like people that I'm like I can't even believe I'm talking to this person right now. I'm so excited. I'm on the phone with them. And this is like literally their assistant coordinating with me. Well, you know, and like, like you feel like so like you're like, I'm some loser that's just like waiting here to talk to you. And this one's got an assistant and she's on a flight right now. And I'll connect you guys in like 30 minutes and this, that I'll give you a call. And then I'll connect you once you guys are on the line. Like this person doesn't even have the time to even like make the phone, like dial the phone number themselves, you know, and they took the time to speak with me. You know, like, and some people, you know, don't, and that's fine too. But I mean, how do you, like, they're, they're, they're still humans. Like, you know, like they're, they, they speak to people, you know, like, so, and I, I try to do the same, you know, again, like paying it forward. Like when people ask to speak with me, I don't fancy myself that important, but you know what I mean? I'm like, I'm available. Like I'm not available for hours, but yeah, I can speak to you for 30 minutes about yeah. whatever I, questions you might have. Yeah. Yeah, a few good nuggets of wisdom, right? It's like, what's the worst that can happen, right? Like, mm-hmm. you should still get an email back. Like, that, like people the, don't like rejection, yeah. though, and they don't think that they think that we have a you know the celebrity culture, especially now, is makes people look untouchable. Mm-hmm. Like Beyonce to everyone is like they call her queen. You know what I mean? Like she's our queen. Like I mean, I love Beyonce, but like <laughs> don't get me wrong. But but you they you make them so austere that they almost don't feel human yeah. anymore. Yeah. No, I can read it. I've, I've, I've done this a few times. Actually, recently, it, like, I reached out to uh, a medical professor, Henry Minzberg. Because, okay. you know, our firm does, like, strategy. And, like, mm-hmm. I'm like, I, I don't think we're, you know, we're at the top echelon of understanding some of the core fundamentals. So I just wanted to reach out and, and get some feedback. Yeah. And surely enough, you know, I get an email, go see the guy. And it's like, the, the guy is like, you know, uh, he's, uh, what's the word, summit? Like, he's, like, one of the best well-known people in the world, basically. Mm-hmm. World run expert. Took half an hour of his time and chatted. And I'm like, you, 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 there's, you don't lose by trying, right? Well, also, but I think what people, a lot of people, <laughs> like, overlook is the fact that most people are flattered that mm-hmm. somebody wants to speak to them so badly, mm-hmm. they actually end up talking a lot more than you think. You know what I mean? Like, you're, yeah. they'll probably end up speaking to you way more yeah. than the time they had said, you know? Yeah. And also, that's the way I've gotten a lot of free mentorship is by, like, when I actually spoke to the person that I wanted to speak to, they were like, oh, she's actually, you know, interesting. And yeah, I'd love to be able to, you know, I'll help you whenever you have a question. Just let me know. And I'm like, sweet, you know, like now I now I have someone I can lean on mm-hmm. whenever I'm not sure about, you know, something or if I want an opinion or whatever. And, you know, so it's like, again, it's just making it's like it's just like making friends in yeah. school. Right. Yeah. Very good point. What do you do outside of work? I and mean, we spoke about, about this a little bit before. And it's like stuff that I think also gives you insights about like, you know, just human behavior and pain points. Uh, so just curious, like what, what, are the, what are the stuff you're involved with today? I mean, I work a lot with my hands, but that's, you know, my, I have a BFA in design. So like, I'm, I'm an art kid. So like, I like doing anything that I can be in a studio and like get my hands dirty. But I mean, I spend a, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm an ambivert. Like, so I'm somewhere, you know, I'm not an introvert, but I need a lot of alone time. So like, I get worn out really easily, like by a lot of human interaction. And I'm also an only child. So I'm used to spending a lot of time by myself. So it's like, I like doing a lot of activities that are like in my house, like cooking or whatnot. You know, I was saying to you before I make preserves, which is, uh, you know, a very grandma thing to do, but I really Hmm. like them. Do you sell Um, them? (laughs) Where can I I get? I do. I have an Etsy shop, but it's close. It's it's on hiatus because it's only summertime. So I make small (laughs) batch because I pick the fruit also. So like for me, it's sort of like... It, it makes me feel like I'm back in like, you know, the hills of Italy and I'm like picking my fruit and <laughs> making my preserves and then they go in our canteen. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's just something that I picked up from my grandparents that I really like doing. So it's, it, do you find that doing manual work with your hands has, has helped you either a disconnect and be more focused when you're at the job or is there any, 
uh, any, I hate to use the word synergy, but <laughs> is there any synergies with like your job in the sense that you understand how stuff works with your hands? So that gives you a, cer a certain skill to uncover how, you know, things with pixels work, for instance. No, no, no. So fortunately, it doesn't go that deep, but it definitely is a my Zen time. Like it's, yeah. it's I don't listen to any music. It's just silent. Like no, yeah. when people do it with me, they're always like, can't we turn some music on? I'm like, why? The silence is so nice. Like, yeah. you know, and I think the taking time to do something, whatever that might be that you like is important, right? So like, this is something that I enjoy doing. Like people would go to me like, how do you go home at night and do this for like four hours? Like, why aren't you exhausted? And I'm like, I, but I love doing, like, I love it. Mm. This isn't like a punishment. I'm doing this because I want to. Mm. It makes me feel, it makes me really happy, you mm. know? Like, so for me, it just, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, I, I you know, I, I'm, in another life, I'd be a chef or something. You know, I'd be very happy in the kitchen. It's not too late. <laughs> it's not. You're right. It's not. Um, uh, one last question, just out of curiosity. Like, I find that you have this uh, this ability to discover pain points and friction that mm -hmm. sometimes people don't always realize. And we're speaking about, you know, potential future projects that we won't get into. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> um, but it, it goes back to the same theme of pain points. Like, where there's issues and you see like this uh, human behavior that um, that's untapped yet. Um, do you find what do you find that just comes from your design background? Thinking about design and um, just curious to pick your brain on on how you've come up with these pretty pretty interesting ideas so far in your life. I for me I I study trends. I mean I'm not not even that I study them. I'm just oh, I'm in tune with it. Like I guess like I pick like I'll. It could be any kind of trend, you know what I mean? But it's like, I'll notice it. Like, I'm very visual, right? So, like, you'll see one person wearing this, and then I'll, next time I see it, I'll be like, oh, someone else has that yellow thing. Oh, now there's other, I'm like, yellow things are going to become a thing, you know? And then all, all of a sudden you start watching, like, everybody start wearing yellow, right? Like, so it's just, I'm just using that as an example. But it's, um, you sort of look for, you look for patterns, right? Like, or cracks. Like, it's like, that's the thing. It's like trends are, the repetition of a something, right? It could be a problem. It could be a disease. It could, you know what I mean? That's what, that's what makes things become a trend. Um, and then the pain points are also sort of that you see people always experiencing the same issue. And so like, and then you start, you keep seeing people say that, or you have a conversation and then it, like you and I were before and you were like, Oh, it's funny. Cause of this, that and I'm like, that's interesting. Cause I've been thinking about this. Mm. And then you start to have that conversation more with people start going, hey, do you ever wonder this? And they're like, oh, yeah, totally. And I'm like, why isn't anyone talking about this? This is interesting. Or you are seeing people say, you know, you see it online or whatnot. I think it's just about being really attentive <laughs> to information, right? So whether yeah. that be something visual, um, audio, you know, like something that you're reading, whatnot, you start seeing repetition somewhere. So hmm. that's sort of where I start to notice pain points or cracks or trends or whatnot. Yeah, they're very interesting. Yeah. Just being perceptive and, and listening. So yeah. Yeah. Well, observing. Cause you know, everyone's walking around with their phones in their faces all the time nowadays. Yeah. Like it's amazing what happens when you put it away for a few minutes yeah. and actually pay attention to the 3d world, you know? Yeah. So. One thing I've done is just like put in a flight mode a lot more often. And like, so you can't get, you know, that dopamine rush of notification. It just like allows you to work. <laughs> so, oh yeah. I always say, I always say, I'm like, if, if we can just turn Slack off for a couple of hours, yeah. the productivity that would come out of it. Yeah. Like imagine you actually had to get up from your desk and go have a real conversation yeah. that you, and a lot less people would get up. They'd probably spend some time figuring it out, figuring out their, their issue instead of having direct access to that answer yeah. or whatnot. But yeah, no, I mean, phones for me are... Um, I go, my phone's on do not disturb from 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. every, every night. Mm. Like, so nothing can disturb me during my sleep because yeah. my sleep is very, very important to me. And then during the day, like, I just don't look at it. And I, I don't enable a lot of desktop notifications yeah. on purpose because I don't want to know when it's time for me to go find out. I'll, I'll find know, out, yeah. right? Yeah. But yeah. I see people who have constantly have alerts and things popping and I'm like, how do you get anything done? Yeah. Like, how do you pay attention? To like anything you're doing when there's something constantly like poking at you, reminding you like that, you know what I mean? There's something else you should be doing. So, yeah. so yeah, I've struggled with it, but I'm getting better. <laughs> you just put it away. Yeah. Like you're far enough away from you that you can't go look at it. Yeah. I, you know, I volunteer in um, a kitchen. Um, actually, I'll, I'm happy to talk about this. Um, Centre Paul de Roulin in Plateau. Oh, cool. yeah. And so, you know, because you're in the kitchen, you have to wash your hands like every time you touch something that's not, you know, that's not, hasn't been sanitized, right? So that means your phone goes in your bag 
or it could go in your back pocket, but then you're going to have to, you know, but why? Like I'm cooking, right? And I got like three hours to do this, you know, so it's got to yeah. be done because there's like a hundred people waiting for food, right? And so my phone goes in my bag and I got to tell you, when I go at like 1230 to like check my phone, I feel like a rock star. I have all these texts. Like I feel, I'm like, this is amazing. Like you yeah. feel so popular, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So I actually like putting my phone away for a couple hours because it, it actually, every time I, I finish the shift, I'm like... This is great. Like, mm. and now, and it was such a nice time out for three, four hours to do something else without any interruption yeah. from my telephone. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I'm very for getting offline and getting. <laughs> I, yeah, I find, like you mentioned, Slack, it's like Slack should build a feature in the product. They should find a way where they use some kind of like machine learning and just like figure out that you shouldn't be bothered right now. Slack is uh, a real problem. Yeah. Like, I know it was a really positive thing at first, mm. but like, like, and we, we used HipChat first before Slack came out. So, like, I know Slack came out bursting and everybody just adopted it, right? But they're really actually causing a fundamental work problem. And there's something about that that they're going to have to figure yeah. out because it's not a good thing in the end. The tool is definitely helpful. But what it causes as a result is a humongous problem in productivity in companies. Yeah. Yeah. I can't, yeah. You just see it within my small team. It's like we're just on it from... 8 to 11 yeah. every day and sometimes like sometimes it's fun it's the random channel and things are jokes but oh like, yeah those are fun. it's like you, as soon as you have a work thought and a work thing and it's like oh it doesn't matter it's 10 p.m then that signals to everyone i'm working which like so i expect a response even though maybe you should like it doesn't really matter it's not that urgent so it's like sometimes it just signals that again we're, we're humans and like we don't understand it's like well just don't look at it it's probably not that urgent otherwise someone would be calling or you'd be you know, so yeah. Remember when everyone had a desktop computer and no cell phone? I do, yes. So, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> Even like before where the you internet. Put it, like, there was no, you didn't have a laptop. Your yeah. work was at work. Hmm. Like, like my mother, for example, she has a desktop computer still. Hmm. So, like, at her work. So, like, she'll sometimes on the weekend be like, I don't know if that email went through or this. And she has no way to tell. And I'm like, what a <laughs> serene weekend you're, yeah. you have. Like, you can't check your email. She hmm. literally cannot check her email. She cannot do any work. Hmm. She literally has to go to work on Monday morning. <laughs> and I'm like, this is actually a blessing, the fact that her company is kind of in the past you know what i mean yeah. like because she actually has a really healthy personal life because of that yeah so yeah, yeah. i think that's a great way to end it karina i want to thank you for your time <laughs> no I guess last question where can people find out more connect with you online um probably all my all my things and my side things are all listed in my instagram profile so probably actually that's the place i'm most active it's kind of funny to say okay, but no, good. I'll, all I'll my link to all my links to yeah. etsy my etsy shops and things that i work on on the side are all there so it's kind of funny it's all i will uh, be buying some preserves <laughs> yeah no they're they're it's fun it's local i love local <laughs> and like it's my little passion yeah. thank you again Karina. thanks Thank you for listening to the Point of No Return podcast. Never miss an episode by clicking on the subscribe button on iTunes or Google Play.